Yeah. Well, what I was going to talk about today is a subject that uh, is dear to my heart. Um, let's call it, uh, that's not very, nice, so I get some larger ones. Let's call it the human soul as part of the human soul series of talks that I'm doing. And uh, this one is called Taking Personal Responsibility. How do you spell responsibility again? I-B. I-L-I-T. Yeah, okay, that's good. Now, I probably shouldn't let, have let everybody know the subject of the talk tonight because I know that some didn't come because of the subject of the talk tonight. So, um, and ironically, this is going to probably be one of the most important talks you'll hear about the Divine Love Path. So that's an interesting thing that uh, many people don't respond because of that. But many people have asked me in the past, like, how have I personally progressed when I haven't had anybody to ask questions of all the time, I haven't, asked, haven't had anybody to tell me about the spirit influence that I've been under, I haven't had anybody to tell me what's going on with my life in terms of the emotions and my addictions and my expectations and I haven't had anybody to let me know what's going on with regard to um, my childhood causal emotional injuries that I can't remember and then on top of that of course I've got a whole series of emotions related to 2,000 years of life that I've had to work my way through and I've had nobody to tell me what they were either all of the emotions connected with all of those things and my answer is actually that I learnt to take personal responsibility. Because what I want to, the basis of this talk is, is this. God is in an interaction with you 24 by 7. I'll just write that down. God interacts And let's make it more personal with me 24 by 7. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, God is interacting with me. Every single second of your existence, God is interacting with you personally. Interacting with you personally. The problem that we have as individuals is we do not engage in the interaction. When I say we do not engage in the interaction, I'll explain it in a lot of detail through this talk as to why that's the case. But if you can imagine, let's say I began... Let's, Barb, you want to come up here for a moment? And can I have a mic? Thank you. Now I'm going to totally ignore you, Barb, actually. And what have I just done? I've got Barb in my space... She's here, she's confused now totally, and I am not interacting with her at all. I'm not even looking at her, I'm looking at you, and I don't want to talk to her at all. Now, she is still present, is she not? She is still there? Is she still there? Oh yes, she's still there. And, and I am just totally ignorant of the fact that she's there. Constantly there. Still there? She's still there? Yes, yeah, she's still there. So she's constantly there, and yet I am refusing to interact with her. That's exactly what we are doing with God most of the time. Thanks, Barb. You didn't even need the mic, did you? <laughs> and the reason why we do that is because while God is constantly interacting with us and constantly aware of every single moment of our existence and every single tiny thought that you have and every single emotion you feel, God is totally aware of every single one of those things that are going on inside of you at every single second of your existence, whether you're here on earth or whether you're in the spirit world. And God was actually interacting with you even before you came here 
although because you were not yet aware and not yet had any free will to exercise because of the unawareness, you didn't know it then. But we have the ability, as soon as we become an incarnate being, to know that God is doing this with us. Does that make sense to everyone? So if you can just picture God is right there next to you every single moment of your existence. But what happens inside of us is we do all sorts of things to stop the interaction from occurring. And as a result of that, it's like God isn't there 24 by 7 for us. It's like Barb was just sitting there at the back and I didn't ignore her. That's what we're doing most of the time with God. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, if God interacts with me 24 by 7, all I have to do to take complete personal responsibility of my life is come to a complete awareness that that is occurring at every moment. This interaction is occurring at every moment. Everything that happened to you today, God knew about and God was aware of and God wanted to be involved in your life with regard to those things. But we often feel that God isn't involved, God doesn't care, and we have a lot of other emotions about it. But it's very important to understand that from God's perspective, he is present there all the time in our lives, 24 by 7. Now, once I understood that as a feeling, and, and that, that feeling began with me, uh, 2,000 years ago, pretty much. I was a very, very young child, uh, just above a couple of years of age, about two and a half years of age, playing with some creatures as child, some scarab beetles back in the Egypt at the time. And, and I was becoming aware that every single feeling I was feeling, there was some kind of response inside of me. Now, I wasn't conscious of it in terms of a, a, a conscious thought, at this moment, because I was very young, obviously, and not very developed. But then as I was growing, I started experimenting with this awareness of this truth, that God is interacting with me 24 by 7. All I had to do was be to become aware of it. And, and sure enough, as my life developed uh, over the coming years after that, so by the time I was six or seven years of age, I was very conscious of the fact that there was an external presence who was an individual that I could receive love and communicate with, who could also communicate with me, if I was aware of how the communication would actually occur. And God was interacting with me not only by a personal interaction, but also all of her laws were interacting with me, 24 by 7 as well. So I started to become aware of, say, things like the law of attraction, which you've heard of, right? and how that affected me. And then I was become aware of the different laws of like cause and effect, for example. And then as I was growing up and I began to get involved in mediumship with John the Baptist, because he became a friend when I was about 13, we were cousins, and he was a very good medium and he'd be talking to spirits a lot and after a while we started experimenting with that, I started seeing the laws of communication and rapport with the spirit world and how all of those were constant and how God was interacting not only with me and with John, but also with all the spirits that were present around with us at any single moment. There was a constant interaction occurring. It's just that most people were totally unaware of that interaction. Now, once I understood that, once I started to understand this one principle that was so important to understand, I then realised that the only problem with me becoming closer to God was all to do with me. It actually had nothing to do with God as to whether I was far away from God or close to God. It was everything to do with my own stuff and how I dealt with my own stuff. And so taking personal responsibility meant for me at that time was I'm now aware that God wants a communication, constant communication, constant rapport with me and yet what I was doing at different moments was detuning myself from that and then retuning in at a different time and then tuning out again and tuning in again and tuning out again and tuning in again and so forth and that's what was the cycle occurring. 
And then I started becoming aware that actually for most people, they weren't even tuning in to the awareness that God was there 24 by 7 and they didn't even, half the people didn't even believe in God as a personal entity and so of course couldn't have a personal interaction. Now, once I started to aware, become aware of this and experimented with this over and over again, it became a reality to me that God was ever present in my life and also wanting to be ever present in everyone's life. And the only thing stopping me from interacting with God, how God wanted me to interact with God, was my own condition, my own feelings, my own emotions and so forth. And that meant then that if I wanted to become at one with God and I wanted to become at one with God's truth, that I had to change. Everything was, the onus was on me to bring myself into harmony if I wanted this relationship, to bring myself into harmony with how God communicates and with all of the laws that God had produced to allow that communication to exist. And so I started realising that this, this part of personal responsibility was perhaps the most important thing that I could develop within myself, to take personal responsibility for absolutely everything in my life. Now, later in this discussion, I'll talk about what responsibility is and what it isn't. But let's look, about, look at the areas in my life then that I had to look at as to where I wasn't or was taking personal responsibility. So first, I started to go, all right, God is interacting with me in a physical way, 24 by 7. In other words... Everything that God had created allowed this physical body to exist in this physical realm and allowed me to express myself through this physical body. So my physical body, being in the physical body, was in a very, very important part of my connection to God. Now, if you think about it today, many people tell you that your physical body and being in your physical body is not important connecting to God. In fact, many would rather that you detune from your physical body or go into some kind of metaphysical state through meditation to tune to God. But I actually realised really early that actually God created this body so I can interact with God with this body. So I had to look at, firstly, what areas would I need to take physical, personal responsibility? And when you think about that, you might start thinking, well, okay, um, physical responsibility, I suppose, in terms of caring for your body. But how, how about caring for your body? What areas? Isn't it what food I eat? What I drink? How I treat my body in terms of the care I have of it? Can you see... I'm starting to realise that actually if I want to become at one with God, eventually I'm going to have to take personal responsibility in every one of these areas. I'm going to have to, have to at some point not expect anybody else to feed me, <coughs> but rather I will eventually feed myself in a manner that's harmonious with all the God's laws. I would have to be very conscious of what I ate, Right? if I wanted to be harmonious with God's laws and God's principles. In other words, harmonious with the love that was ready to be received as long as I was open to receive it. I had to look at what I was drinking, what I did to my body, how reckless I was with my body, what I allowed other people to do to it, what they would get away with, if you like. And when I say allow, I mean, would I walk away from a situation or would I stay in a situation? that might cause violence to my body. What would I have to do? I'd have to take responsibility, personal responsibility, all these physical areas. And then I realised too that, of course, what I saw between my mum and my father was a lot of emotional stuff where my father would not take responsibility for his emotional stuff and he would get angry and then he would blame mum and then she would get upset and she would not take responsibility for her stuff and then she would blame dad and, and away it went, right? And I'm talking, yes, about Joseph and Mary, you know, the people that all, many people have an idyllic viewpoint of. These were my parents, and I have a much closer viewpoint of what was happening in my childhood in the first century about that. 
And so I had this, I started seeing that actually these fights that happened between my parents and disagreements and detunements that occurred between my parents were all because there wasn't any emotional responsibility being taken. And I realised then that I'd have to start taking emotional responsibility for every interaction. Every single emotion that I felt was actually mine. Nobody else could feel it. And I started realising that nobody else could actually feel my emotions if they were detuned from their own, either. And I started seeing the relationship between emotions and detunement from God. How do you know God is present if you can't feel God's presence? You don't know, do you? It's like God isn't even there. So I started seeing I had to take personal responsibility with all of my emotions. And then on a spiritual level, I started looking at how people would disown responsibility spiritually. So in the, in the, in, in the time in Egypt, it is before I was 13 years of age, and what would happen is all the people trusted the priesthood for the interpretation of the, prof the prophets that I was reading at the time. We were taught to read it at quite a young age and what we had to read was what you would now call the Old Testament in the Bible, much of that which, which was the prophets that I was interested in. And what we would have to do is read it and what I, what I realised was that every single person who ever read it trusted the interpretation of the priest as to what that meant. And I started seeing how everybody started to not take any personal responsibility there either. What they were doing was they trusted what the priest said and then they blamed the priest if he was wrong. And this is a product of, of doing this and not taking personal responsibility. The product is we start to put our trust in others and then when they're wrong, we then blame them. And actually we like that system, many of us, right? We like to be able to blame someone else because that means we don't have to take personal responsibility and see it was a choice inside of us. And I started seeing that the entire priesthood, which if you could think of it now, the entire religious structures that we see in the world today, what I, what I call the priesthood back then, was actually constructed in order to help people not take any personal responsibility. With, of their relationship with God. They were so called the intermediaries. They became the intermediaries of their relationship with God. So instead of me or the average person having a relationship with God, I had to go through a priest to have the relationship with God. Assuming, of course, that the priest felt more of God than I did and knew more about God than I did and so forth. And then I started realising that actually that whole process was not taking any personal responsibility for my own relationship with God. And so what I began to do then was start to look at, all right, if I wanted to have a relationship with God, and by the way, obviously, I had spirit guides guiding me through these awarenesses, just like you have spirit guides guiding you through your current awarenesses today, right? I had spirit guides guiding me through all of this process, who helped me come to terms with many of these things, right? And so after a while I realised that there was a lot of different areas in my life that I was going to have to take complete personal responsibility for. Just me. Nobody else was responsible. Even my mum and dad were not responsible, I realised. So by the time I was a teenager I realised that nobody in the entire world was responsible to help me physically, to help me emotionally, or to help me spiritually. The only person that was, was me. I was responsible to help me physically. I was responsible to help me emotionally. And I was responsible for my spiritual connection with God. Now, for many of us, that sounds like a heavy burden, because we, we want someone else to come along and help, help us on the road, right? But actually, in a lot of ways, it's the most freeing thing you can ever understand. Because if, if only I am responsible for my connection with God and no one else can actually help me and no one else can, in, so, in the sense that no one else can take responsibility for, for what I'm doing and no one else can do the emotions for me and no one else can make the spiritual changes for me, that means that I have total control 
over what changes I make within myself as long as I'm willing to be God-reliant. So if I can focus on God-reliance and then take personal responsibility for everything God is telling me, then I'm going to progress towards God. So I'd like to put it to you that actually God is in your face trying to tell you truth 24 by 7. Now, some, of, some people have come out to live with me for three or four days and they know what it's like having a person in their face 24 by three days. <laughs> All right? And most people get very angry and very upset and ve like very distraught at times and, and some people have got so angry and so upset that now there's a whole like internet followings of them getting angry and upset about what I've said. Does that make sense? Well, you imagine what it's like when you recognise that God's in your face 24 by 7 with truth. When you actually take real responsibility for that. What's that going to feel like initially? You're just going to be overwhelmed with the constant bombardment. Now, many of you who have children, when they're very, very young, notice that you get overwhelmed quite a lot, don't you? Like there's this law of attraction going on with your children where your children is con are constantly reflecting back at you their, your own emotional injuries. Now at the time, as parents, we don't think that. We think there's just something wrong with the child. What's wrong with it? I don't, I've got no idea and we get into confusion, but we're overwhelmed by the constant emotions they're going through and I'm getting triggered and I'm trying to nurse them and trying to feed them and trying to this, try to, and we're in this busy period of, like, and, and everything's bedlam. And yet, really, all it is is demonstrating to us that truth is available to us 24 by 7, actually. Uh, and our child is reflecting that to us. And usually all their awake moments and sometimes half of their awake moments and half of their sleep moments half the time, right? And they are reflecting those things to us constantly. Now, if they can do that, then what do you think God's trying to do with you? God's trying to constantly connect with you and connect you to the truth. And the only thing stopping God from being able to do that is you. The only thing stopping God is me with my own personal relationship. So, if I don't take personal responsibility in all these different areas, what's going to happen is sooner or later my relationship with God will stagnate. I will be ignoring God in certain areas of my life and that will of course have its own effects just as if I was ignoring God's laws in certain areas of my life, it's going to have effects. Now, every time I refuse to take personal responsibility, the result is always going to be one thing, and that is pain. So pain is an indicator, whether it's emotional, spiritual, and there is such a thing, by the way, as spiritual pain, whether it's emotional, spiritual or physical, the pain is an indicator that I'm not taking personal responsibility in something. God's trying to tell me something and I'm not listening. Because I just want to, no, no, I want to hear that one. No, no, that one doesn't sound very good either. No, you're trying to tell me what? What? That I'm not a very nice person at the moment? No, no, don't believe that one either. <laughs> and we're just rejecting God pretty much constantly when we begin uh, an awareness of ha about God, we, we're usually at that point, we've rejected God pretty much constantly throughout our, our life. And the pain is an indication, physical pain, so pains in my body and what's going on with my body internally and externally. And then emotional pain, like the emotional pain I have in relationships, in my friendships, in my relationships with my parents, children, <laughs> uh, lover, partner, all of those kind of relationships, my relationships with authority, my relationships with the world, my relationships with workmates, and every single person in my life, any pain that I'm receiving there is, a, is something that I'm ignoring God about. And then spiritually, what kind of pain might be result spiritually? I have the pain of not knowing the truth. Now, many of you have experienced that pain, right? Where you know what it's like, you're searching, searching for something that has meaning, something that has some meaning in your life, 
and those kind of pains, something that can demonstrate to you the truth and you search and search for search and after a while you become disillusioned with truth and disillusioned with life and so forth, that's all spiritual pain. And any spiritual pain tells me where I'm also not taking personal responsibility. But of course we don't want to hear that. We want to hear that uh, actually that's not true, that it's all God's responsibility. So a lot of the times what we finish up doing is saying, right, if God cares about it so much, then, then how come he just doesn't tell me? And the answer is, if we understand personal responsibility, the answer is, he can only tell you what you want to listen to. See, once I take personal, full personal responsibility, I am willing to listen to everything. I don't try to shut it down. So let's say all of a sudden we were in an interaction, you and I, and we were both taking full personal responsibility for the interaction. Now you could be yelling and screaming at me and if I want to stay harmonious with truth and harmonious with love and not have any personal pain, which by the way I can do while you're screaming at me, right, I would have to actually own every single emotion that's going on with me and that will keep me connected with God. It will keep me connected with God's laws and God's truth as well. And, and it will make me closer to love every single time I do that. And I am taking full responsibility in that space for my own emotions. And full responsibility even for my own law of attraction as to why I have a man or a woman yelling at me at this moment. Now the responsibility isn't that I did something wrong. And this is something that I'd like to discuss with you about responsibility. It's not about blame. It's about taking responsibility for my emotions that flow through me, how I feel about what's actually happening and how an emotion in me that needs to be healed actually created this event that's going on that is being attracted into my life. That's taking full personal responsibility. When I take full personal responsibility, I don't get angry in return. As soon as I get angry in return, straight away I know that I'm out of full personal responsibility and in trying to make the person who I think is causing me the pain, I'm trying to now make them responsible. Does that make sense? Joy, you want to ask a question? If we could just... Yes. Um, just to clarify, you said that as long as you are taking personal responsibility, then you are connected to God. Is that what you said? Well, what I know, what I'm saying is that if you take personal responsibility, it means you'll know at any moment why you're not connected with God. Okay. And so you'll find out if you don't know. So, so it doesn't mean that, you, like, because you can be in the first fear condition when you begin this process, right? Or you can even be in a hellish condition when you begin this progress. So, for myself, I was in a suicidal place when I began my progress. So, I was in a pretty dark place emotionally. Right? Now, in that place, I wasn't taking personal responsibility for my life. The instant I begin taking personal responsibility for my life, now I have the capacity to progress. Now I have the capacity to grow towards God. God is interacting with me 24 by 7, and if I understand that and I take responsibility for that, I treat, start treating every single moment as a learning moment to help me get closer to the love and closer to truth. Every single moment. Right? It doesn't mean I'm perfect yet and it doesn't mean I'm at one with God yet. All it means is I've begun this process now and this is one of the things that is needed to begin the process of taking personal responsibility for my life, not blaming anyone around me for where I am. Now, there's a big difference between blame and who's responsible in terms of the emotional creation and what was the cause and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when I'm saying take personal responsibility, I would, myself, take personal responsibility for every single emotion that's within me and the fact that if I'm not hearing God, it's something to do with me. It's not, something, it's not your fault that I'm not hearing God. So I can't come along to Joy and say, Joy, why can't you tell me why I'm not hearing God? Like, straight away I'm out of harmony with personal responsibility because, because actually it is my, there's something inside of me that causes me to not hear God. And you might know and I might... I might be able to come to you and say, please, Joy, if you know, can you tell me? That's totally different than saying, Joy, why don't you tell me? Like, uh, what? And projecting rage and anger at you for the... And that basically is trying to make you responsible for my relationship with God. 
And this is what many do with me and have done through history. They have blamed me for their relationship with God or lack of one. And many of you will be feel very inclined to do it now, by the way, <laughs> to blame me for your own relationship with God or your own lack of relationship with God. Does that make sense? And you don't. And the key is, nobody else in your entire existence can be ever blamed in terms of can be accurately or truthfully ever blamed for your own lack of connection with God. Right. There are certainly many creations in you that they are responsible for emotionally, which is a different subject which we'll talk about in a minute. But in terms of taking personal responsibility, it doesn't matter what's happened to your entire life, you are capable of listening to God as lo at 24 by 7, because that's what God created you to do in the end. So you're capable of it. The fact that we're not doing it is because most of the time different emotions kick in and I don't want to take responsibility. For example, I don't want to take responsibility for what I eat. I want my wife to cook my meal every night. Straight away I'm out of harmony with personal responsibility. I don't want to take responsibility for how I treat my body. So, you know, I get to 45 years of age and I start getting cancer and then I want everyone else to fix it not taking any personal responsibility the fact that I must have created it somehow. There's some emotion in me that must have created this. And, and my expectation that everyone else fixes, fixes it is taking the responsibility away from myself and blaming others. Does that make sense? And with regard to spiritually, I can blame, you know, the, the Catholic priest or the nun or the, or the, you know, Anglican fellow who was really bad to me or you know the Baptist minister who was a like whatever and then I can or I can blame the Buddhist monk or I can blame anybody and uh, rather than actually take personal responsibility for the fact that I listened to them and I then made some choices about that listening to them and I trusted the fact that they must know more than me and that it was my choice not somebody else's choice can you see how Personal responsibility is a very important part of your progression. Now, if you focus on taking personal responsibility in your life for your entire life, you automatically bring yourself into harmony with many of God's laws. And that's a, that's a beautiful fact that we need to come to realise. That once I own everything that's going on inside of me and externally in my environment and I own it, I am now, at that moment, now enacting or, or working in harmony with the laws that God has created to bring me closer to God. So straight away my life's going to get better in that regard in getting closer to God. And it's the areas where we don't take personal responsibility that are the most difficult for us to give up. Remember a few weeks ago I gave a talk about addictions and expectations? Expectations and addictions. We become here, yep. We become so addicted to certain things. So if I'm a man who goes to the work every day and I'm married and my wife started cooking when we got married and she started cooking lovely meals and I was quite impressed with that. I like that. And I come home every night and wow, well, there's another lovely meal. And so I sit down and enjoy a lovely meal with my wife. And then the next night, wow, well, she's also cooked another lovely meal. And so I come home, sit down in front of that, eat that lovely meal. By the third night, this is happening. It's sort of, I'm starting to see actually. I don't have to cook for myself anymore. Right? And if I've come from mum cooking for me for 25 years, straight into my wife cooking me for, for, for the next you know, 20 years, do you think by the time I'm 45, I'm going to actually have a longing to cook for myself? <laughs> of course not. Because everybody else is doing it for me and has done it for me all my life. Right? But I'm not taking personal responsibility. You see? And, and so what I do is I say to myself, all right, no, I don't need to do it. Somebody else is doing it. Isn't this wonderful? Right? But I'm not taking personal responsibility. And the moment one of those persons now stops doing it, what happens now? I get all upset. I've worked all day. What have you been doing? Like, how come I haven't got the meal on the table? And, and away I go, right, with all this stuff. 
which is all me not taking personal responsibility, added to the fact that I've done it this way for 45 years. There's all this emotional energy now behind me not wanting to give up this addiction. And every addiction is the result of me not wanting to take personal responsibility. Every time I get addicted to getting a feeling from somebody else, it's because something inside of me needs that other person to feel, feel something inside of me that I'm not taking responsibility for. If I was prepared, for instance, to grieve the fact that my wife didn't cook to me for me tonight, so in other words, instead of yelling and screaming at her and telling her off for not cooking for me tonight, I was prepared to come in, notice she hadn't cooked for me tonight, and sit down and just cry about it. Now you think that might be laughable for most men, but that's what they need to do rather than yelling about it, right? They need to just sit down and feel the fact that they feel now unloved and that there is this expectation there and all of these addictions there. And if they were prepared to do that, now they're taking personal responsibility for the emotion that's driving their rage. But we don't. A lot of the times, what we do instead is we just project our lack of personal responsibility onto the world around us and we want other people to be responsible for that. We want them to go back to what they were doing. And so we want to control them. We want to manipulate them back into this place where I don't have to personally take responsibility for my life. So, I, so in the example I've given, I want to manipulate my wife by this anger and rage into a place where she feels so bad about herself that she didn't cook to me tonight, she'll never think of not cooking for me again. And in all of that, I've avoided the personal responsibility that actually I am totally responsible for this body and therefore totally responsible for every ounce of food that goes in it and its creation, not my wife. And any time she does it for me, she's giving me a gift which I can choose to accept and appreciate, and when she doesn't give me the gift, do you think I should yell at her? How, how dare I yell at her? She's allowed to not give me a gift of preparing the meal one night, isn't she? Or two nights, or ten nights, or the entire time she's with me, in fact. She's allowed to not do that if she doesn't want to. Does that make sense? And, and if I take personal responsibility, I will feel nothing as a result of her doing that. I won't feel angry with her or upset with her. I won't feel like, you know, that she doesn't love me anymore or that she's not treating me well anymore or any of those things because I am willing to take personal responsibility for my food going into my body. Mind you, she also needs to take personal responsibility for the fact that she's not perhaps earning the money that you just earned to get the food to put into the body. So you are perfectly also okay to work half the week instead of the whole week and ask your wife to work the other half to make up for the fact of what goes into her body. Does that make sense? And she, if she complains about that and says, oh, you're not a very nice man, you don't provide for me, why don't you provide for me? What's going on here? You don't treat me you like as if I'm a good woman and you're not treating me securely, I'm not secure here, you know, you don't really love me. And she carries on, what's she doing? She's acting in her own addiction and not taking responsibility for the fact that she is responsible for her creations and she is responsible for the fact that she needs to get food to put into her body whatever way she can do that that's in harmony with God's laws and principles. So what happens most of the time with regard to personal responsibility is, and when you look at the creation of the universe, creation of what we've got in our earth, I should say, in terms of what man has created, there is so much that's been created to help everyone avoid responsibility. Isn't there? Avoid emotional responsibility. So I'm not responsible for any of my own creations, particularly to avoid physical responsibility. Almost all medication that's created nowadays is all about trying to help a person avoid what they've created physically in their own body. So where did headache tablets come from? Oh, what we want to do is take away the fact that the person doesn't want to cry and is always trying to suppress tears and is always trying to suppress emotions and has this headache as a result. And what we do is instead of telling them why they've got this headache and it's a result of their suppression of emotion, what we do instead is we say we want to take the responsibility of their creation away from them. 
because we're so sad that they're in this pain, right? And they're in this pain and they're complaining about the pain. And so what we do is there's a whole industry called the pharmaceutical industry which create like billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of, of, of profits and everything, by the way, from doing this, come about from creating a product which will help the person take away the effect of their own creation. In other words, that takes away the responsibility from the person for what they've personally created in their own body. Does that make sense? That's what's happening. And if you look at it in terms of what's happening in the world, what about emotional responsibility? Oh, I made a decision to follow some guru. He told me, he told me that sex with anyone was fine, so I finished up having sex with a few children in the process, right? And now I'm in jail because I'm an abuser and I, and I blame the guru. How can I do that? Like, did I have sex with the children or not? Did I make the choice or not? How can I go ahead now and sue the guru for his, for his suggestions when I made the choice? When I'm not taking personal responsibility for why I made that choice? Does that make sense? By the way, he also would have to take personal responsibility for his choices and his suggestions and whatever else as well. I'm not suggesting that's not the case. But I would need to take personal responsibility for my decisions. You see this happening a lot. I'm walking along the road and there's a there's a there's a there's some kind of you know cut in the road, right? Where there's a where there's a ditch. And I fall in the ditch, break my leg. Who do I want to sue? Well, you should sue yourself. <laughs> really, if you're going to sue anyone, it's like you've got eyes, like most of us have. You know, you've got eyes, you can see, if you look down, you can see the ditch. If you are aware of your emotions, you can feel intimate, in, 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 I can't even say the word. <laughs> Soon to happen, danger. <laughs> and, and you would actually avoid it, would you not? All right? If you're sensitive to your environment, you certainly would. And so on there, I've done, uh, this thing has happened. I've not treated it as my law of attraction. Instead, what I'm doing is I want to make someone else responsible for my law of attraction of what happened to me. Right? So what do I do? I look at who I can sue. Actually, I don't know if I set this up, did I? Yeah, that's going. Sorry. Um, I look at who I can sue, who I can actually get some money from now, who I can blame for what I did. In America, that's big business. Uh, you, you've heard of, like here in Australia, there's not much advertising for lawyers. In the US, I don't know if you've ever been over there, but in the US, they actually have lawyers advertising on telly. And you know how there's a lot of um, uh, movies now that, that actually display lawyers chasing ambulances, you know, that, you know, what are called ambulance chasers? Well, that's because nobody wants to take personal responsibility and they want to go to a lawyer so that they can blame someone else for what was they were responsible for. Now, I'm not saying in all of this that insurance companies are not responsible for what they create because I'm saying exactly the same applies to them. And other companies, banks and other companies, are not. they are responsible for what they create too. Even the organisations that we have on the planet today are totally responsible for what they create. But do any of them want to take responsibility? No. What happens with a bank, with a bank who does a lot in terms of uh, shares and whatever, and they find themselves overstretched with some kind of futures? And all of a sudden they're, they're almost about to go broke, and who comes to their rescue? No, no, not the government. You do. Your taxes do, actually, come to the rescue. What's that bank doing? It's blaming you, it's making you responsible for their decisions. That's what it's doing. Conversely, what happens when we go and invest our money in a bank, or in, and perhaps not in a bank, but in the bank's shares or something like that? We're now making them responsible <laughs> for the creation of our wealth, of our wealth. And you see, we do this all the time on the planet. We're constantly trying to get people and other people to take responsibility for our life, even in a physical level. In an emotional level, it's even worse. Almost every single interaction that we have with another person 
generally we're trying to get something out of them emotionally. When you think about it. Like, if your husband came home to you today and said, actually, I slept with a woman last night, sorry about that, what would you do? Would you go, no worries, love, uh, we need to talk about this and we'll need to work out whether we need to stay together and everything. Not likely, hey. You would probably want to make the man responsible for your emotional pain that you feel as a result of his actions, would you not? Most of us would be tempted to do that. What if it was our wife doing the same? Same sort of thing applies, doesn't it? Generally, we finish up projecting all this anger and rage and how dare you do that and what did you do? And, and, and we project all this stuff at them because we want them to be responsible for the pain that we feel. And they're not. The pain we feel is inside of us. that They can't do anything about it. Of course, they could choose to not act that way, but even if they choose not to or, at, or to, they are not responsible for our emotional response to what we do. Now that sounds like a really harsh truth, but it is true. If on the divine love path I understand that's the level of emotional responsibility I have to take for myself, then I'll start getting an understanding of how much God is actually talking to me at any one point in time. So, so how does this relate to what I, how I began? Well, how it relates is I started to realise with all of these things that I had to take personal responsibility for absolutely everything and as long as I was God-reliant and trusted that God was leading me closer and closer to her in my relationship if I took responsibility for everything, if I took responsibility for everything that was happening to me and everything I was feeling and everything, my physical form and everything that was happening spiritually for me and I took responsibility for all of that in the sense that I owned it for myself and I didn't blame anybody else for it, now God could work with me personally and I didn't need to have a priest or a minister or a guru or an avatar or some spirit or anybody else telling me how I should progress towards God. Because God had the capacity to tell me these things through this relationship that's now been established by me choosing to take complete responsibility. Does that make sense to you? Now, once I understand that, I can understand the importance of my own development and my own relationship with God and that no one else is to blame for me progressing or not progressing. No one else is to, responsible for my lack of progression. No one else is responsible for how bad I feel today or this emotion that I'm going through that I can't seem to release over the last three weeks. No one else is responsible but me. And if I rely on God and I have this connection with God and I listen and listen and take notice of everything that's happening in my law of attraction and everything that's happening causally towards me, I will eventually get to the truth of this matter. And I don't need to have, but I enjoy the gift that anybody else can give me helping me get to that place but I don't feel that they are responsible for even helping me. Right. Now, when I've got that level of personal responsibility, I have made a big, big shift inside of myself. And that shift is going to result in a very, very powerful relationship between myself and God. Because for the first time now, God has the ability, through myself taking responsibility in every aspect of my life, God now has the ability to communicate with me through the laws and communicate with me via spirits and also to communicate with me directly depending upon my own connection with her. So if you can imagine God being here like that and here's, here's God and here's me, God can talk to me directly, or when, you, when I say talk, you won't hear it as words, by the way. These will be through your emotions. The way God talks to you is through your soul, through your emotions and through your passions and desires. So God can motivate me that way. Now, there are times when I'm not listening to God, right? but if I'm still trying to take personal responsibility, God can then motivate a spirit to attempt to be more overt in the manner in which I'm spoken to. Now, 
that might not be something that I can listen to. So God will actually, has already created a group of laws which automatically will trigger me and show me what's going on as well. God's created all these things. Like, and if I had to list everything God's created, God's created like hundreds of different of mechanisms in order to expose the truth to you. It's just that most of the time we don't want to listen to the truth. And that's what, because we don't want to take personal responsibility for our life. And as a result of that, we finish up ignoring the laws and ignore the spirit. We ignore God. We ignore all of our law of attraction. We ignore everything that's coming, that's being said to us. And in the end, we think we're alone. And we think nobody's helping us anymore. And we believe that, you know, there's no way of ever finding out the truth. We're never going to be able to find out whether love is, exists or not. We're not ever going to find out whether God exists or not. And this is what we believe. But we only believe that because in the end, we don't want to take personal responsibility for what's really going on. I have to, in this scenario, trust that God loves me and wants to communicate with me. Can you see that? You see, see, if I, if I go down the track of saying, all right, to myself, no, there is no God, then straight away, God's not communicating with me 24 by 7 because I'm feeling there is no God. It's like me saying there is no Barbara. She was sitting there behind me and I'm, no, she wasn't there. She doesn't exist. And what I'm then doing is ignoring, once I start to ignore God and start, and start to tune out of God in that way, of course I'm going to start not taking personal responsibility for everything that's happening in my life anymore and I'm going to start blaming people, blaming the world, blaming others. The beauty of taking personal responsibility is that it always will bring you closer to God if that is your desire. Now, if it's not your desire, then of course it's not going to do anything. You can take personal responsibility for your life, but if you don't desire God, then of course that's not going to be a part of your life. But if you desire God, if you have a passionate longing for God, then what's going to happen as long as you take personal responsibility for everything that blocks that relationship, you'll find actually that God is right there next to you waiting for a complete connection at any one moment. And the only thing stopping me from actually feeling this connection is my own state. Something within me that I'm not taking personal responsibility for. Now, if I do that, I will actually long for truth. So this is one of the results of doing that. I will long, I'll have a heartfelt longing for truth 24 by 7 as well. So a little child comes up and says, oh, you feel real angry and walks away. And I just laugh at it. How does a child think? A child wouldn't know whether I'm angry or not. I remember I was with one child, he was three years of age, and um, there, were, there were eight adults in the room. And he just came in the door from playing, he stood in front of each adult and told them exactly what their emotion was. And he, then he walked back out again. <laughs> he said, you're angry with your mother, you actually want to kill her. You're, and the guy who she spoke to in that moment said, what? What are you saying? To, you're angry with your mother, the child said. The three-year-old child said, you're angry with your mother and you want to kill your mother. Just as a three-year-old would say it, right? And then he went on to the next person, right? And this guy's going, I'm not angry with my mum. Mum, mum was there in the room. I'm not angry with your mum. Like, God just told him something through a three-year-old child reflecting an emotion. And he was in total denial of it and therefore isn't longing for truth 24 by 7. What about our law of attraction? We drive along the road, we've used this one before, someone cuts us off, law of attraction event, I just ignore it. What have I just done? Ignore the truth in that moment. Somebody cut me off to trigger an emotion. The emotion's not coming up, so I'm really detuned from my emotions right? if a cut-off event occurred. Because the truth is that when I'm totally in tune with my environment, I'll actually know beforehand that this person's probably going to cut me off and I'll back off and let them in anyway. <laughs> right? 
But what will happen when I'm not in tune with my environment, I'll be driving along and they'll cut me off and I'll slam on the skids and like feel that instant rage come up. Today, um, myself and Mary were driving in Brisbane, wasn't it this morning, Alan, I think it was, and, and there was a semi-trailer, he, was, he had to come across the lane to get into a different lane, and there was this man in a rural fire brigade car, and he just went berserk. He was holding on to the horn like this, yelling and wanting to wind down the window, you know, yelling. And he was going, and he was, he was, there was so much frustration in him that the whole car he was in was shaking. Right? Screaming, he was screaming as well, bang, bang, bang on the horn. Of course, the semi trailer driver just ignored the whole thing. Right? And the guy eventually gets out the other way, drives past the semi trailer driver, gives him the fingers. And, you know, and beeping as well. It gives him the fingers and drives on. Right? He just ignored an opportunity that God was speaking to him with. Right? Why was he so upset? There was something in him that was being triggered. There was some rage covering some grief that he needed, you know, a feeling that he was being ignored and overlooked and being pushed out of the way and quite a few other feelings I could feel from him. And he didn't want to connect to any of those childhood feelings that were all bottled up in front front of him that God at that particular moment was trying to help him access. He was taking no personal responsibility for the event at all. Either, the law of attraction event. You see, if we long for truth 24 by 7, we don't care where it comes from. You don't care if it's a child that comes and tells you. You don't care if a little tiny two-year-old comes up and bites you in the leg. There's a law of attraction event, right? Something's going on. You would actually work out what's going on. That's what you would do. You would allow yourself to feel what's happening. If I long for truth 24 by 7, I don't blame the child or its parent, perhaps. But rather I feel what my own emotion is about all of these things. I allow myself to feel it. I take personal responsibility. Rage and anger is a great indication that I am not taking personal responsibility in that particular moment. Does that make sense? Right at that moment. In fact, what I'm doing when I'm in rage or anger is demonstrating that I am not listening to God in that moment. Because if I was listening to God, I wouldn't be in rage and anger anymore. I would be usually in grief or some other emotion where I'm releasing something that that law of attraction event brought me. When you take personal responsibility, you have a desire for truth all the time. It's not, not one of those, not one of these things, yeah, yeah, I long for truth. Don't tell me anymore. Don't tell me anymore. Like, I don't want to hear anymore. I've had enough today. I can't cope with anymore. It's not like that, right? It's like, no worries. Bring it all on. One after the other, if that's how it's going to be. Remember that your soul, at any one point in time, here's your soul, at any one point in time, it has a whole group of emotions, some of which are healed emotions that are harmony in harmony with love. So let's put them into two categories. There's ones that are harmonious with love, and then there's ones that are only harmonious with fear and error and untruth, right? Now, those harmonies with love will produce a lot of loving events, events that feel good, right? So, yeah, my wife wants to make love to me. That feels really good. Nice event for me, right? That's a positive thing from my law of attraction. Make sense? Right? My wife totally ignores me tonight. Now we're talking about another different law of attraction that I need to actually work my way through. An opposite law of attraction, something based on fear and untruth and error inside of me is my response that it's triggering. I need to feel that. I need to allow myself to feel that. There'll be a loving reaction. Now, what often we do is we take complete responsibility for all of those. Every nice thing that happens to me is definitely my fault, is the way we go, right? So I got a lovely job, isn't my law of attraction wonderful? Right? And I got a lovely wife, isn't my law of attraction beautiful? Like it's just my like we've got plenty of funds. Isn't our law of attraction just wonderful? You know? Oh, you know, I got a broken leg today. 
yeah, that mongrel in that car, you know, that I crashed into, you know, he just cut me off. Straight away I went from what? From taking responsibility for all the good things that happened to me to actually ignoring responsibility for all the bad things, so-called, that happened to me. Right? We do this all the time, don't we? But if I long for truth 24 by 7, I would say everything that's happening to me right now is a part of something that's going to help me heal something inside of myself. It's going to help me overcome something inside of myself. Um, yep, if we have a mic. I think it's on, yes. Um, you use the word God sends you and law of attraction together. Can you just explain the relationship between... Well, firstly, God created the law of attraction. So the law of attraction is God's messenger of truth to me, is it not? So, so really I could treat my law of attraction as actually God is telling me something, couldn't I? I could say, basically I'm saying with the word law of attraction, that's a nice sort of metaphysical way of really saying that God, who created the law of attraction, is through the law of attraction telling me something that's inside of my soul that either is great, because my law of attraction showed me that it was great, or is actually need, in need of healing, because my law of attraction is showing me that it's in need of healing. So the law of attraction is God's messenger of truth to me. Yeah? So I can interchangeably say God is showing me or my law of attraction is showing me because God is working through my law of attraction to help me through things. Of course, that's not the only mechanism God has. You know, we talked last week and last few weekends, we talked about desire, right? And how desire activates other things occurring to activates other mechanisms for us to find out truth. So if I have a desire for truth, if I'm actually longing for truth, it's not just my law of attraction that's going to be responding. People will come up and give me gifts of truth because of that desire, because I have a longing for it. And God responds to that longing. So did not God create that law too? Of course. So can't I then say God responds to your desire? that everything in the universe is created around desire. He created this whole, the whole way you create is by having a desire. So therefore, if that's the case, if God created this entire universe like that, then surely isn't that saying to me that actually God created this aspect of having a desire and what it does? So God is showing me because of my desire. Does that make sense? So everything that God has created is just perfect and wonderful in the way of showing us how we can get closer to God. Of course, God has also created, uh, and so you could call that, if you like, a positive feedback system. Right? In other words, a feedback system that shows us that we're on the right track and you could say what's a negative feedback system is a feedback system that shows you when you're on the wrong track. And God gives these feedback systems to you constantly. Every single moment of your life is a response of a feedback system that God has created at some point to demonstrate to you where you're out of harmony with divine love and where you're in harmony with it. Right? And taking personal responsibility for your life is great because it exposes all of those things. Now let's take this personal responsibility though a little further because all of what I've discussed so far is really about natural love in a lot of ways, right? in the sense that God is demonstrating to me at any one moment when I'm out of harmony with love that, is, that I'm capable of expressing. In other words, the love that's coming from within me to the universe, I'm capable of expressing in complete harmony with perfection. And when I do that, um, I will be actually taking full personal responsibility for my life. However, there's an area of my life that I'm still not really taking full responsibility for, and that is my direct connection with God. With God. Now, that direct connection with God is dependent on me longing for God's love. Me growing, my soul growing beyond the capacity of an average human soul into what we could call the divine soul. And that is about longing for love. And that has to ha also come from the heart. And I also need to take personal responsibility because God is waiting for me 
to activate this longing inside of my own heart. In fact, the soul is created really cleverly, actually. And when you see this in the spirit world, and there'll be a time in the future where you will see this in the spirit world, here's your soul, here's God, and I'm not drawing God smaller, um, saying that he's smaller than you, but... All right, so there's your soul and there's God. God's love is waiting to enter you at every moment. The only thing that can prevent God's love from entering you is you. Does that make sense? And the only thing that prevents it, so in other words, we've like got, if, if this is our soul, if you picture your soul as bigger than you, surrounding your two bodies, surrounding your physical body and your spirit body, We've basically got around our soul a blockage, like a wall, a barrier, that prevents this love from entering us. And what opens that barrier is only one thing, and it's a pure desire, which the pageant messages, if you've read them, call a longing. It, and the beauty of a longing is that it actually opens this part of your soul. If you start longing for divine love, longing for God's love, assuming God's an entity and you're longing for that love, what it does it, is that it opens a part of your soul that has never been opened before. And in fact, you can keep this part of your soul closed for the rest of your existence, if you wish, as far as it is known. And if you do that, you will only ever progress to the sixth sphere of the spirit world after you pass, and you won't progress beyond that point. Infinite progression is only available to those who are willing to open this part of their soul. It's a part. It's a bit like a part of you that you need to 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 uh, that's under your control that you need to open before before divine love can flow in. It, it's like you having control of a bottle, and I've obviously. Let's draw a... And the bottle has a, has a lid. Right? Now, let's say this bottle is like a, um, an expandable bottle, you know, like one that has a, has a stretching size, like a balloon, right? which is really what your soul is like, actually. Now, the only thing that's capable of expanding it is pressure. Some things coming into it, something coming into it that will fill it up and then fill it up beyond overflowing that it can expand into. But your soul before this point of this opening, this longing, is actually like a bottle of glass. In other words, no matter what you do, it's never going to be different than the bottle of glass. It's going to remain the same shape, the same size. It's not going to stretch. It's not going to have a bigger capacity than it's got until... Like, and I don't mean as it's got now. I mean as it's got in the perfect state, in the sixth year state. It's never going to have a bigger capacity than that. But as soon as you activate your soul and you take personal responsibility for your desires, and that's what activates actually this longing within you, then all of a sudden it's like taking the lid off this bottle and allowing oops, allowing God's love to flow in and expand it. And it transforms the soul. It actually changes the soul into a new creature with totally different attributes and qualities, totally different things that you are capable of doing that you couldn't do before. Right? And some of you will notice this beginning at a very... So once you start receiving divine love, you start feeling like, wow, I can feel people's emotions really easily now. Like I know what people are feeling. And then after a while you receive a bit more divine love and you start realising, hey, not only do I know what they're feeling, I also know what emotions are locked up in them now from their childhood. And, and then you progress a little more and you go, whoa, not only do I know what emotions are locked up in their childhood, I know what events cause those emotions that are locked up in their childhood. For some reason now I can feel all of this from them automatically. Does that make sense? And then you progress a bit more and then all, oh, all of a sudden you start seeing spirits. Like, why is that? You know, that happened automatically too for some reason. I don't understand that. And then 
a bit more opens up, receive a bit more divine love, and all of a sudden you've got your capacity to feel the emotions of the spirits and feel their history and be able to speak with them. And then you let a bit more open up right, at your soul level. And as you're going, a lot of changes are happening, right? Your soul is expanding in its capacity. All of a sudden you start understanding truths that nobody else seems to get. Why is that? Like, it just seems to come to you, like, for some reason. And you start understanding truths that no one else seems to get. And then you open up a bit further, and then you realize that everyone who is getting these so called connections with God, these so called gurus on earth and everything, a lot of them are actually just being influenced by spirits. You can actually finish up seeing the spirits transmitting information, much of it's false, by the way, to these people. And you go, wow, how come I know all those things? Well, you know all those things because you began to take personal responsibility to ex exercise a pure desire to long for God's love that opened a part of your soul which now enables your soul to expand and gather all of these attributes that are a part of your growth. That's how it happens. But if you decide to not take personal responsibility and you say, all right, no, no, I don't agree with that. What I'll do is I'll trust this guru or that particular person over there and I'll do what he says for a while and do the metaphysical thing and, 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 you know, change my body this way or that way. You know, then I'm not actually exercising this pure desire towards God. What I'm actually doing now is I'm desiring that person, whoever that person is, to actually be my mediatory between myself and God. And by the way, if you do that with me, it's just as bad as if you've done it with anyone else. Right? So no one is your mediator between God and yourself. There is no mediator between God and man. Now, that's in direct contradiction to what the Bible, by the way, says. Because the Bible says that I'm the mediator between God and man. Well, if you believe that, you're going to have a lot of trouble in your relationship with God. Because I'm not. Do you think God would create one of his children to be the mediator for all the others of the children? Of course not. God wants all of you to have a personal relationship with God. Right? Now certainly one person, one child of God that's learnt more is able, able to tell others what he's learnt, just like if you learn more about music, art, whatever you want to learn about, there'll be others who don't know as much as you on that subject. If you might be an engineer and other people might not know as much as you on that subject. You might be a scientist and other people won't know as much as you on that subject. Right? So God created all of us with these unique skills and talents of which in the end we may know more than anyone else on the planet or anyone else in the universe for that matter at some point. Right? But none of that matters from God's perspective with regard to our relationship with God. When I take personal responsibility for that, realizing that God has always wanted a relationship with me and all I've got to do is have the longing for it and actually have the longing for truth and I take personal responsibility for the fact that I don't have the relationship I want with God right, and look at all the things within myself that cause me to not have this relationship with God that I really want, once I do that, now I'm able to progress and continue to progress no matter what anybody else ever in my life says or does or thinks or tries to do towards me. It doesn't matter. I will continue to progress on that path. Now what we finish up doing, unfortunately, is we finish up getting stagnant at times, right? So, you know, we're trying to listen to what God's saying to us, but we can't, we feel we can't, and there's all different law of attraction events that are affecting us, but we don't know how to interpret them, and we don't know how, what we're feeling. And so at that moment, what we start trying to do is making others responsible for our relationship. So what we do is we run along to a medium, we say, what's my problem? And sure, if they want to give you a gift, they will try to help you with the problem you have, but, but Oftentimes what I'm doing is I'm now projecting at them that they are responsible for what's going on with me. And I need to stop doing that. Nobody is responsible for what's going on with me. They don't have to help me. I can have a longing for help and then somebody may desire to help me because of my longing, 
But if I try to heavy a person into assisting me, what am I doing? I am now being demanding, out of harmony with love. I'm not taking personal responsibility for emotions that I'm feeling, the emotion that I'm confused or frustrated or whatever other emotion it is. And what I finish up doing is projecting at others this quality. Blame. Blame is something where I am saying that you are responsible for what I'm feeling. And it's never a truth. Nobody is ever responsible for what I am feeling right now. In the sense that nobody else can feel what I'm feeling right now. Only I can feel it. Only I can process it. That's not the same to say, this other thing might be true, what is the truth of the event, of the cause? And that's very, very different to blame. Now let me illustrate that. I may have an emotion inside of me where my mother, from the time of two years of age to the time of five, abused me violently. So she might have done things like put cigarette burns on me to control me and punish me. She might have locked me up in a room. She might have done... All, now, I'm using an extreme example here on purpose, but she might have locked me up in a room. She may have withheld food from me for days. She may have poured soda, caustic soda down my mouth and burnt all my gullet and take it, had to take me to hospital to get that fixed. She may have done all these different violent things towards me. Right? The truth is... She did do those things. And the truth is also that I'm allowed to say that she created those things. That's totally different to blame. She is the cause and her actions are the cause of the emotions that exist in you, if you were the son in this case. She is the cause of those emotions. However, it's impossible for her to be responsible for your emotions now because she can't feel them for you. Only you can feel them for you. Does that make sense? So while she is the cause, we can't go ahead and say that she is to blame for me being in my locked up state now because the only person that can take responsibility for me being in a locked up state emotionally is myself. In other words, I am the only person that can release it. Nobody else can do it for me. No matter how much I want to make her, my mother, who in this case I'm giving, my, my own mother wasn't like this, but in the, in the case I'm giving, my mother who did these damaging things to me, right, she cannot feel my emotions about what I did. Now, there is a whole series of law of compensation things that will happen to her that she'll be having to feel as a result of her actions and the damage that she did for me, and only she can feel those things for herself. Nobody else can feel that for her either. But I can't, I can't make her feel what I'm feeling, no matter what I do. So I could get my mother in a room and do exactly the same thing for three years that she did for me when I was little or to me when I was little and I still can't make her feel my own emotions and release them from that. And that's the truth. Right. Now can you see on the earth today what we want to do is we want to go into blame. So what we do instead of taking full personal responsibility it's like somebody comes from another country and they kill our child. And then what do we want to do straight away? There's a big desire in us to, all right, I'll go to their country and grab their child and kill their child. They can just see what it feels like. Are they going to be able to see what it feels like for you? Of course they can't. They cannot feel and they cannot release what you've got now inside of you, the grief that you've got inside of you. No matter what action you take, this grief is going to remain inside of you. 
So what's the point in going killing their child and creating a whole other series of grief and pain and suffering because it doesn't actually get rid of the emotion that's inside of yourself. It doesn't release it. Does that make sense? Can we have a mic? Uh, AJ, how does that relate to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Well, of course the eye and an eye for a tooth for a tooth doesn't work. And if everybody followed it, as Gandhi said, we'd all end up blind. Uh, if you followed eye for an eye, everyone would end up blind. Because uh, you did something to hurt me and I said, so I punch your eye out and then I punch your eye out, you've got to punch my eye out. And away it goes, you know, and the whole world would finish up totally damaged, which is what the world is in, ending up. The whole concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is a damaged concept and certainly not based on love. So that was never what was, I mean, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Oh, it's certainly in the Bible, yes. And it was certainly channeled by a spirit to Moses, who was the person who channeled that material. But it didn't come from God. No matter how much God and Moses claimed it came from God, it still didn't come from God. It came from a spirit in the spirit world who had a very vindictive feeling about anybody who did anything of damage. And it's not based on love, it's based on justice. And justice and love are two totally different things, by the way. Like, if you want justice, like, love overcomes justice. If you want justice, yeah, go for eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. But look at the world we're in, isn't that the attempt that's made? Well, I was thinking more around the terrorists and what have you, that's the... Totally. Operator. And has it worked? Like, so we've now got no terrorism because we went eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that the case? It's never ending. Okay, it's never ending, is it? It created more terrorism, did it not? Like, of course. You know, look at the wars that are going. How many children in, in Afghanistan and, and in, in Iraq have died as a result of this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth? What if every one of those parents decided, well, hang on a sec, my child wasn't involved in terrorism. Now I want to go to America and make a few of those people who killed my child have their child die. Let's do an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. In America, we'll then go and, go and call that terrorism. Right? Like, how is that terrorism? That's just an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So if we want to practice that, we get the world we've got. And, and it's a pointless process. And it's like, and sooner or later, you know, someone is going to get out the sledgehammer and bump, bump me in the nose, and then, and then I get out a, gun, a knife and stab him, and then he gets out a machine gun and shoots me, and then I get out, you know, it, well, you know, if I'm still standing, I, I press the button for the atomic bomb in his location. You know, like, this is how wars escalate, and it's how the world has been since, since like, the last five or 6,000 years. And has it worked? No. Justice doesn't work. What works is love. And they're very, very different. See, when I take personal responsibility, I am no longer focused on blaming. For a start, I know, once I take personal responsibility and I've learnt more truth, I know actually that actually every single person that died, including my own child, is now in the spirit world still alive. So, so what's the point in trying to create another person and put them in the spirit world? Like, not much point in the action, really, in the end. So, so I actually know that my child is still alive. If, my ch if I know my child is still alive and I'm connected to my child emotionally, then, then do I actually finish up wanting to kill another child? Would my child want me to kill another child? Of course not. Like, so in the end, what I'm doing by blaming is I'm, I'm trying to actually project responsibility for my emotions onto the other person. So, sure, that other person may want to kill me, but the principle still applies. As soon as I blame him, right, for what I feel as a result of that, and there are many spirits in the spirit world, by the way, in this state, who have been murdered and are in a state of blaming the murderer and not progressing as a result because they don't want to let go of their emotion about the murder. Right? So, so, why? Because they want to blame, because blame gets you out of personal responsibility. Blame lets you get away with not taking personal responsibility anymore. Do you see this happening in relationships all the time too, between partners, right? 
where one person blames the other for how they feel and the other one blames the other for how they feel. Now, if both of them owned their own emotions about how they felt and took personal responsibility for their own emotions, things could be sorted out a lot more rapidly. But often that's not the case. We blame the other, the other blames the other, and we have an escalation of violence, verbally, right? And before we know, we can't live with each other because we're, because we're in this state of the escalated violence, verbally. And we're afraid that we might actually want to take a knife up at some point, <laughs> you know, and escalate it into real violence. And, and this happens, doesn't it, in domestic situations a lot where people argue, people argue, it gets so intense, 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 and so intense that now spirits connect to it, and before you know it, you've got all sorts of violence being perpetrated towards each other, all because we want to blame the other person for what I'm, what I'm feeling. So we've got to get rid of the concept of justice, because none of it works, and we've got to start accepting the concept of love, because it's the only thing that works. And the way we do that is by taking personal responsibility for all of my own emotions. The moment that I project my emotions onto another person, I'm out of harmony with love no matter what they did to me. So they can abuse me, write terrible things about me, plaster it all over the place, slander me, do all sorts of things about my life that are not true. And at the end of the day, if I then take action against them, I am out of harmony with love. And ironically, I'm also not taking personal responsibility for my emotions. Or my law of attraction, for that matter. But certainly for my emotions. Once I take personal responsibility for my emotions, I would release the emotion. I'll go, all right, I'm being attacked, doesn't this feel terrible? Yeah, yeah, no, it connects me with childhood events where I was attacked unfairly and I was blamed for things I didn't do and I have all this grief that I release about it and I release this grief. And before you know it, I get into this state where no matter how many times I'm attacked, it doesn't affect me anymore. And I can be attacked constantly and yet I can be happy. Right? And they, anybody can do anything towards me and I still feel great. That's where I can be. John? Uh, Victoria from Los Angeles asks how, how we should work with our Kaido. With our? Our Kaido. Our Kido. Our Kido. Oh, the, uh, the uh, terrorist group, are you saying? Yes. Exactly the same as we should work with anybody else. She also work, asks how should we deal with the prison population? Um, exactly the same as we should do with anyone else. Um, let's, look at, let's look at those issues from taking personal responsibility. If I'm taking personal responsibility for my own life, then I will also want to put in place a, 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 a situation where everyone else also can take personal responsibility for their life. So if we were in a community, if you and I were making laws what kind of law would we create for a person who's a murderer? What we would have to do is we'd have to create some kind of system where the murderer has the opportunity to take personal responsibility for the murder they created, wouldn't we? So rather than actually chucking them in jail for 20 years in a, in a, bunch, a bunch of other murderers where they've got to fight for their life for 20 years and they come out even more hardened than what they entered, wouldn't it be far better to actually put them in a different environment where there's not a bunch of murderers, but rather people around them who care for them and people around them who try to assist them to go through the process of taking responsibility for what they've done? When they take responsibility for what they've done, they will actually then start going through their emotions, not only their emotions about what they created in other people from, from their choice of what they did, but also the emotions that cause them to make the choice to murder the other person. They will start processing their way through those emotions. And when they get through all of those emotions, they will be in a healed place and they would never, ever, ever again contemplate a murder. But you know what we do historically? What we do if we don't uh, chuck them in jail, what we finish up doing actually 
many times, and this is still the case in many of the states in America, is we enact corporal punishment. So what we do is we get this character, this mean character, shall I call him mean, murderer, who's full of rage and no care for any other human, obviously, or no, certainly no care for the human he murdered, we get him and we sentence him to death. And you know what all that does? All that does is it puts him in the spirit world as a spirit with all of these qualities still in him. Now you just imagine for a moment, you're now a spirit, you have access to anyone on the earth, not just the people in the location you were in before, you have access now to any single person on earth and you can influence them through your emotions, through your rage and your anger, and you can influence him to do lots of different things if he's in a state that's similar to yourself. This man now becomes so dangerous that he can influence 20 other murderers to, on earth to do what they want, influence their rage and their anger or whatever it is into murder. That's how dangerous he becomes in that process. Is it, what's the point of doing that? Like, there's no point to it. Wouldn't it be better to help this murderer actually make soul changes and give him a choice. The choice is, here's where you live, you've got to look after yourself, you've got to provide your own food, here's all the tools that you've got to grow it, we're not going to feed you anymore, here's the tools and here's the seeds and here's the stuff to grow all of your own food. You've got to do that. Now, if you want to know how to do that, you ask one of these people and they'll help you. If you don't ask, then they won't show you. And then you say to him, also, if you want a house to live in, here's all the materials. There they all are on the ground. Here's some tools. You've got to build your own house. We're not going to build the prison for you and stick you in it. You're going to build this house and you're going to put all of your effort into it. And then on top of that, You've got a group of emotions in you that have created this terrible thing that you've done. What we're going to do is while you are in this state where you've got those emotions, we are going to ask you to live in this location where you can build your own house and eat your own food and all of your other things that you create for yourself until such a time as you have a longing to actually deal with the emotional reason why you did that murder. And as soon as you have a longing, a real longing to deal with the emotional reason why you did that murder, what we'll do is we'll provide some people to assist you to work through the emotions that caused you to do it. And then what we'll do is as you work through the emotions, you'll come up with lots of different feelings and all these things and you'll need to work your way through lots of different feelings. And what will happen is as you release the different emotions, eventually we will feel from you, and the truth is if there were people who were helping them who could feel, you would be able to feel these emotions, we'll feel from you that you don't want to murder anymore. And when you get into that state, what we'll do is, you know this wall that we've put around this compound where you've now got your house and your garden and your, and your way of life and everything, what we're going to do is we're going to take it down and move on. And that's yours to keep. Now, do you think there'd be a lot more murderers who uh, actually come out the other end of that system with some uh, with no desire to murder? Of course. Right? But instead of doing all of that, what we do is we build these great big concrete jungles where they've got a cell block, of a, a very, very tiny cell block, and we put them in that, and we put them in that with all the other murderers. We call it a high-security prison we feed them. So in other words, we have to pay now for what they've done. When, when, like, how ludicrous is that? Why should we have to pay for what they've done? They need to cook their own, get their own food and grow it and right, do all of those things rather than we having to do it for them. They need to build their own prison with their own resources. If they've got a thousand bucks, if they've got ten thousand dollars in the bank, then that's all used to buy some of these resources. If they've got, if they've got no money at all, then we give them an allowance, a loan that they have to pay back. <laughs> Right? to build the things that we need, that they need to live on. Now after that, do you think they'll have learnt a little bit about personal responsibility? Of course. 
they'll have learnt that, all right, not only have I learnt now to have some personal responsibility for my life and my food and my clothing and my shelter and everything else, but now I also had to take personal responsibility for the emotions that caused me to take the life of another person. And then what I do in the part of this process is I bring in all the people who were affected by the murderer's actions. And I ask the murderer to talk to the people. And, I, and instead of the people blaming the murderer for his actions, what they do is they own their own feelings about how they felt about the murderer's actions. So they explain the grief that they felt at their daughter passing because of the, the murder that was committed. And they explain the, 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 the terrible pain they felt when they could no longer speak with her anymore because they don't know how to speak to people in the spirit world. And they explain all of the different feelings they had as a result. Now, can you see this murderer is now coming face to face not only with all of his own personal responsibility, but also the personal responsibility of all the people he's affected by the action he's taken. Now, that person is certainly going to change through that experience. It would be a very, very hardened person that would die still in that mean, murderous rage after going through all of those experiences. Right? And if he did pass, and he passed in the spirit world in that rage, well, he's now doing as much damage as what he ever did on earth anyway. Rather than us putting him there and him starting the damage from day one without any assistance whatsoever. So that's how I deal with that issue. And again, it's about like getting the person to take personal responsibility. It's actually about helping, creating a series of laws as a community that actually finish up everyone in the community now takes personal responsibility for what's actually happening in their personal life. So the, the, the power of this is immense, by the way. So what you do is you don't give a group of school children a school anymore. What you do instead is you show them how to build one for themselves if they want one. Do you think they'd want to burn it down afterwards if they built it themselves? Highly unlikely, right? This is the beauty of personal responsibility is when you take it, you also have a pride in what you create. That's the beauty of taking personal responsibility. You see how important it is. So it's important in everyday life, but it's also important, even in, it's important in the display of natural love, in other words, in the display of the love that comes from ourselves to others, but it's also extremely important in our relationship with God because only you have control over your own relationship with God. Nobody else does. Nobody else can make it happen faster than you, for you. Only you can do that. Nobody else can do that for you. Now, you can ask for assistance and people are allowed to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to assist you. <laughs> Right? Because they have free will and they're allowed to make that choice. And you, if you feel angry about that, would be out of harmony with taking personal responsibility. Because the truth is that only you are responsible for this relationship with God and this desire to love and desire to be in truth. So the question that comes really, what do I, I want? What do I, what do I want? I'd like to ask about your personal responsibility for your children. Um, well, let's look at yes. that. It's exactly the same principle. So here's me as the parent, right? Here's the child. Did I choose to actually conceive this child? Well, if you chose to have sex, you chose to conceive the child. Does that make sense? So the child certainly, ha you have a responsibility towards the child, right? That is a personal responsibility. A personal responsibility between you and God, actually. You brought the child into the world, what is your responsibility? Your personal responsibility is to teach that child what God wants to teach it. Or in other words, even better, it could be stated, 
to teach the child how to connect to God itself. That's your response. That's your only responsibility towards this child. Right? Now, as the child grows, obviously it needs different things, like it needs food. So what you would do initially, obviously, because it doesn't have the development, you would give it the food it needs until such a point in time where it can start creating its own. Now what age is that? It's not 25. <laughs> right? It's about like two. Do you know what I mean? At two years of age you can start showing it how to grow a plant, how to grow some food, how to take some personal responsibility for what it loves. What kind of food do you like? Let's grow some of it. So you start teaching the child how to take personal responsibility from that moment. Does that make sense? Now, the child starts reflecting emotions back at you. So the child gets angry with you, right? In the terrible twos, let's say it starts that. So it's getting anger and projecting anger at you. Well, I'm the parent and I know from the principles that I've been taught from God herself that actually the child is reflecting back at me something that's needs healing inside of me. That's my personal responsibility. So instead of spanking the child for its anger towards myself, what I do is I look at, all right, what do I feel when this child's angry towards me? Do I go into a panic, you know, and don't know what to do and go into confusion? Or what, what do I do? Do I, do I just do exactly what it wants? And we were with the family today and I was explaining to the family moment by moment what was happening to its child's emotion and what was happening to its mum and dad's emotions. It was a very interesting process. Because what was happening was, moment by moment, mum's and dad's emotions were affecting the child's behaviour. So the child would rush up and give daddy a hug, but would be crying in, a, in an angry way towards daddy. And I'd just say to daddy, well actually what she's trying to do now is control you to take her downstairs to give her a swing. That's what she's trying to do right now. What I would do if I was you is I would stay there and not do it because and say to her, while you're projecting anger at me, I am not going to take you and do anything. And what I would do then as a parent is I'd own my emotion that I've got a two-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old girl trying to control me, which actually means that I've got an emotion about my mother controlling me all of my life. And I need to feel about that emotion. And when I do, and he started feeling it, and all of a sudden, the little girl just hops off and stops crying and walks over to mummy and starts telling mummy what she wants from mummy. As soon as he started to feel the emotion. Right? So what I would do is I'd take personal responsibility as the parent for the emotion that's running inside of myself. And I would see the child as my law of attraction to experience that emotion. The irony is with children is they are so sensitive to any damaged emotions inside of us that they'll automatically stop the projection if we own the emotion. They're only projecting at us because we're not taking personal responsibility for the emotion. So now we've got this three-year-old child who's walking around the garden growing, growing exactly the things that it needs to eat and we're pretty happy with that, right, of course, because there's less that we have to do. And we start showing it how to prepare the food. So by the time it's five, what is it doing now? It's now making a great salad and knows how to make the dressing and it might be a bit messy in the kitchen occasionally, but that's something you also work through with the child with regard to cleanliness and care of its environment and all those other things that you would teach the child. So by the time the child's five years of age, it's now taking a lot of personal responsibility for its own life already. And you imagine if, that, if you kept teaching the child these things, by the time it's 10 years of age, what kind of child would it be? Would it need you? No, probably not, eh? Hey? What, what it would do is it would be, be connecting to God, it would be feeling God, it would be feeling all these truths. It wouldn't need to have you in its life hardly at all but I'm going now, as a, parent, I'm parent, uh, as a parent, I'm panicking because, I, oh, but I need my child to need me, I need my child to need me, and I'm getting all distressed about that, so I deal with my emotion about that. But now this 10-year-old child is in a state where it knows how to prepare its own food, it knows how to look after its own clothes, it knows how to get its own shelter. It's actually probably out of school by now because usually a child in this kind of environment has learnt so many things that it outstrips anybody that can teach it anything. So by the time it's 10 or 11, they've already gone through university, right? And then, and then like, where do they go from there? They just into their life of passion after that, aren't they? 
they are totally self-sufficient pretty much. And, they, and if we've taught them in this manner, that's what our children can be in the future, like that. But of course, we don't like that. Often what we like is totally different to that. I have an eight-year-old son that's autistic, also has some um, intellectual impairment. Yep. We have a tricky time at school. Would that could would that be a law of attraction? My law of attraction that what? I need to also take responsibility. Autism, for I've talked that? about before, and there's been quite a few times I've talked about autism. I missed that. Sorry. And I can't remember what DVDs they're on. If you want to look at them, I think they're one of them is on an Armadale DVD. Uh, where I talked to a couple who had an, uh, who had an autistic child, and um, I've talked about it a number of times. But basically, autism is where the, there's so much barrage of emotions from the child's environment that the child is now totally in tune only with its environmental emotions and not its own. That's why, hence, I'm wondering what responsibility I have in conjunction with interaction with well, that child. Whoever what, is in what, it. What, what law of attraction have I attracted for that to come into my home? You've attracted a very, very sensitive soul into your life who is so sensitive to emotions that all he's feeling is everyone else's emotions and not his own. And hence, I have um, mixed emotions about the education system, the environment that... Of um, course. Yeah, the education system's hopeless I for know an autistic it, child. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Though I have, I, I have a lot of blame on others. I have a lot of blame on myself. But knowing which blame direction. on yourself, by the way, is just as bad as blame on others. That's well, not course. the same as responsibility. Working through all of that, though, I have yep. had that blame, and I recognise all of that blame, and and try and, and get rid of that. But I, it's still very strong within me. Can I just say to everyone, actually, when you blame yourself, that is that is just as much of not taking responsibility as blaming others. When you take responsibility, it's very, very different than blaming yourself. Hence, what, if, what, I, that's, I'll, I'll try and be clearer. Is there an aspect that he is reflecting to me my law of attraction on top of uh, being and being who he is? Is that something that I can actually um, face or um, take responsibility for something that will, that will actually ease his life? Totally. Yes. If you own every single one of your emotions, particularly towards the male that you feel inside of yourself, and whoever is your partner, if you have one, or who's ever helping you care for the child, also takes responsibility for their emotions every single moment of the day, what will happen is the child will now no longer be feeling a barrage of un people who are taking no responsibility for their emotions. So his has definitely increased with my lack of responsibility. I'm not saying it's... In, I'm saying it's caused totally by. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not just increased. Yep, yep. I'm saying an autistic yep. child is caused totally by the barrage of stuff from uh, the emotions, from all of the environment. Um, so it can be whoever is interacting with the child in the environment. So my suggestion for any person who has an autistic child is to view it like God telling them 24 by 7 what's going on at any single moment with the child's emotion. Now when the child is no longer feeling this huge barrage of emotion coming from its environment that it's reflecting back to its environment, right? and in particular if it's a male child, look at your attitude towards men. Look at your stuff towards men. Do you have a female child as well? Or no. you only have one child? No, I have three children, three all children, male. All male, and only one of them autistic? Well, one of them that's troubled with one autism. Of, one of them's troubled with autism, okay. Well, that's a very sensitive child. If it's a male, then look very seriously at the aspects of how you feel towards the male because they're receiving just a barrage of emotions about them that they, you know, that they are totally out of tune with themselves. Now, when they stop receiving this barrage of emotions, you'll find that they are completely free and open to be themselves again and they will start having emotions inside of themselves that come from themselves. So you know how you know, um, often you feel like there's no love in them and there's no, you know, they don't seem to understand love? And no, they don't... He has plenty of love. Of yeah. course. And you can see that as you release these different emotions towards the male, you'll find that love will... and his own concept of himself will, will change much. That's what he needs. Yeah.
Now, one of our batteries is going dead, so I'll just check which one it is. It looks like it might be mine. Thanks for that. What is that? All right. Um, now, I'm not going to have a break tonight. I'm pretty much going to only talk for a couple of hours, and I've nearly done that, and then we'll be finishing. And that way we won't finish too late, uh, as we've been finishing on other occasions. So, do, but do you understand what's going on there with regard to... It's to do with the emotions that it's receiving from its environment that are so overpowering that it cannot feel for itself. And his mic... If you use a mic, yep. say then with my confusion about um, him branching out to the rest of the world and the issues he has with that will just diminish with me sorting out my own issues with the rest issues of the world. with the rest of the world. Spot on. And so it is my responsibility, he is my responsibility, all of that is my responsibility of taking responsibility. Yes. Not my responsibility mm -hmm. but me taking responsibility. For your for own emotions. Own, yes. And that, that's the key part. You, you need to take responsibility for your own emotions. It doesn't mean that you're to blame for your emotions that are in you. No. Because your emotions were created by your environment as a child that you didn't heal, that parents didn't heal their stuff and the environment didn't heal their, you know, as well. And all of those. So how can we blame you for what's created in the child? But we can actually take responsibility yes. for those emotions and process our way through those emotions and release those emotions, and as you do so, you will notice a big change. I think my blame was just the impatience of not getting um, ahead and faster. That, yeah. was, that, was, that was probably my blame. Well, it's very easy to blame yourself with an autistic child because the autistic child is reflecting instantly every single unhealed emotion. And of course, in one person at any one point in time at the beginning of this process, we have quite a list of unhealed emotions. And so it's so frustrating because it's only when the barrage of emotions lessens to a point where there's a critical mass where the child will start actually having its own life and being able to live a normal life as a, as a nor so-called normal child, right? And because there's usually this whole long list of barrage of emotions, not just one emotion, that's being projected at the child. And, th and this is the problem is that the beauty of having an autistic child is it's like it's like a fast track to divine love in the end. It is. Because, because it's like having God in your face 24 by 7. The child is instantly reflecting everything back at you. And I know it's very frustrating at times. It is frustrating, and, and, but it is beautiful. But it is I beautiful. see the beauty. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's a way, actually, for you to really work through a lot of stuff quite rapidly, if you think about it, if you choose to take responsibility for what's going on inside of yourself. So all of the way your child reflects to the environment is all the way you actually feel inside of yourself towards this environment that your child is in. All the, all the way the child interacts with you is the way is a reflection of all the unhealed emotions within yourself that need to be healed. How your child reacts to its father is all a reflection of his own or any other man, male caregiver is a reflection of their own emotions and what they need to heal inside of themselves. You've got this perfect little emotional machine showing you at every single moment what's going on with you. And it's, it's a wonderful thing, really. And this is one reason why autism is becoming something that is growing as a problem on the world, is because the, because the condition of the earth is lightening, which actually means that new children that are, being, that are being incarnating and being born are actually far more sensitive to emotion. And as a result of their sensitivity to emotion, they are also very overwhelmed at the barrage of emotions that they often get from their environment. So you've attracted one of those little sensitive souls. Yeah. Thanks again. No worries. So my daughter's 17 and um, all of her life, basically, I haven't taken responsibility then for trying to make her feel better because I can see now, I've sort of talked to her a couple of nights ago about taking responsibility for her, herself and I'm no longer responsible, and she's like, what, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's now challenging her, mm -hmm. even though I said to her, well, I know that I've caused a lot of what's happening for her. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, because as a parent, you can't help but want to make them feel better. Where's the line, you know, between 
um, looking after them and... Have I ever tried to make you feel better, Kelly? <laughs> Not at all, no. Do you, do you find me doing that all the time with you? No. No. So why are you trying to help your child make... Does God make, try to make you feel better all the time? No. 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 Why? <laughs> I've got to feel it for myself. And because it's not loving. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you don't need to make your child feel better. Yeah. What you need to do is own all of your own emotions that created the emotions in the child. So if your child's 17 or 20 or 50, it doesn't matter, what emotions they have within them often comes from their childhood that I created. So my sons, I created their emotional state way, way before they even left home. Yeah. Right? And I have to own every one of those emotions and release every one of those emotions inside of me. Now, what I've found in my life is as I've done that, my sons have automatically, within a few days or weeks, followed along with very similar emotional processing. Yeah. Automatically, without even me speaking a word to them about taking responsibility for their life or anything like that. Oh. And every time I've been out of harmony with truth, I've automatically recognized that, put myself back into harmony with truth, and that's automatically triggered them. So at one point in time, like I had a, a quite a lot of cash available, so what I did was I bought my boys cars when they were 16. <laughs> they had brand new cars when they were 16. And, uh, and of course, you know, they came to expect brand new cars, of course. And then when dad starts saying, and dad paid for their insurance and their registration and their fuel and their everything else, right? Because of course they didn't have the money coming in to do any of those things either, right? Yeah. And after a while I realised, hey, I was doing all of this out of guilt, you know, yeah. and, that, and yeah. out of some very damaged emotions inside of myself. So what I did was I owned them, I took responsibility for them. And I said, no, no, I can't do this anymore. Now, of course they went into a rage with me for a bit. Why wouldn't you? You've had a car for four years that's been, you know, and everything's been paid for and now you're expected to pay for it. Like, you know, now, of course, they got angry and upset and all those other things and worked through those emotions and I talked to them about those emotions and worked through. And they didn't have to, of course, but they did automatically because I allowed myself to work through my emotions about it. And they came out of it understanding the gift that they've been given and not expecting it anymore as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so when our children become more adult, we can still do exactly the same thing. We can still take personal responsibility in every possible way for the things that we've created in them. And we can heal that in ourselves every time. Just focus on what's going on within myself today. And what's going on within myself, once I heal that, you'll find your child, no matter what their age, will feel very different feelings from you as a result. Thanks. No worries. And um, I'll just turn down this because it's ringing a bit. Um, Joy, you would like to? Hey, Joy, you asked the question you wrote up on the board before, what do I want? Yep. Um, obviously, once I know what I want, I can then take resp personal responsibility for the creation of all of that. You see, often what's going on for us on, in the planet today is we say, oh, I want a new house, I want a new car, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And then what we try to do is make somebody else responsible for the creation of it. Right? And we don't take very much responsibility ourselves for the creations that we, that we want in our life. And we even take it so far as we actually go to a bank and we get them to give us what we want. And then what we do is we become like beholding to them by paying interest to them for the rest of our life almost, right? Most of the time. And so other people finish up owning us because we originally wanted to avoid our own personal responsibility. So what often happens is that instead of asking myself, what do I want? What we finish up doing is we go, what can I get without taking personal responsibility for it? And what that does is it creates this whole system where somebody else can take over my entire life because I haven't taken responsibility for all the things that I'm creating. So what that means is that there's actually a clause on your bank loan that says that if you default, they're allowed to not only take the thing that you've loaned the money for, 
but they are allowed to take anything else as well up to the value of their loan from you as well. Right? So what has that done? That Because you've disowned personal responsibility in your creation of why you haven't got the money to create what you want right now, and so you've gone to get the loan and do all of those kind of things, what now happens is you're now beholding to someone else. And they now have total control of your life and your existence. And I have disclaimed my own personal responsibility, so guess who is now responsible for my life? Someone else. And what can they do with my life? They can totally destroy it under certain circumstances. Many of your grandfathers and grandmothers went through the Depression. Their entire livelihoods were taken from them in this way because they began by disclaiming their own responsibilities, gathering funds through other resources, which were eventually called as debt, and they lost everything. Why did they do that? It's because we didn't take personal responsibility in the first place for our creation of a lack of funds, dealing with the emotions inside of us about money. We didn't take any responsibility for that. And so what we do is we want someone else to take responsibility for it, so we give them, we give them our life, really, in the end. And in the end, what happens is they take control of our life. And this is how governments control people. Right? We, we give them control because we don't want to take personal responsibility for our own creations. We want somebody else to be responsible for our water, don't we? So what do we do? We create this whole great big empire called a waterworks or Queensland water or you know whatever the country we live in water and they go ahead and they get build the dams and they do this and they do that and they, and they build all of this supply and then they charge us for this water. Now what's going to happen? Come an earth change event, where's my water? Because I've given the responsibility for my creation to somebody else. We do it with rubbish too. Like, so what do we do with rubbish? We don't like having rubbish in our backyard, do we? Like, you know, imagine all of our rubbish that we've created last year stored in the backyard. It wouldn't it'd look very nice and it wouldn't smell very good. So what we do instead of that is we, we get all this rubbish and we give it to somebody else to process. And of course what they do with it is they dig great big holes and fill them full of holes that finish up becoming toxic and finish up going back into our water, our own water supply that we're drinking in many cases. And all sorts of things happen as a result of us not taking responsibility. Now if we were living in a way that was just based on raw food, we probably wouldn't even need to have any waste that couldn't be processed in our own home. So that would be me taking more responsibility for my own creations. Does that make sense? So, so in the end we've got to say, well, what do I want? What do I want? If I, what I want is harmonious with love and truth, then I'll want to take complete responsibility for everything I produce. All of my waste, all of my, my food, my shelter, everything. I'd want to take responsibility for it. Not blame anyone else for it when it goes wrong. And if you can imagine a life like that, do you think there'd be plastic bottles strewn on the side of the highway? Like, of course not, because everyone's taking responsibility for the environment and they're taking responsibility for their creations. You know, there might not even be plastic bottles, right? But if there were, those plastic bottles would be used for a purpose that could easily be recycled and all these other things and it would all be able to be done harmonious with love, right? And, and what we would do in the end is we'd be living our entire life in complete personal responsibility. And what I'm suggesting to you is that part of becoming at one with God, if you really want to become at one with God, in the end you are going to need to take personal responsibility for your entire life. And all its creations and your spirituality, your emotions, your physical creations, everything. That's what we're going to need to do, take responsibility for it. That means feeling our stuff about it all and changing it and allowing ourselves to con connect with God who, who is communicating with us 24 by 7 and who I'm, most of the time I'm not listening to. Right? And if I can do that, if I can take that complete responsibility, 
what will happen is things will change markedly in my life. So what will happen is instead of maybe coming along to so many of these sessions that we're coming along to to listen to truths, what you'll finish up doing is wanting to put the truth into practice in your life. Does that make sense? So a lot of times we come along and hear the truth but then we go, well, AJ is saying we're going to have to actually tell the truth to every single person at every single moment. That's a part of taking responsibility for my life, right? Wow, I tried that for an hour last week and it was <laughs> devastating, you know, like, like my, my husband wanted to leave me and my children hated my guts for that hour, you know, I didn't want to stop after that. And once we take responsibility for our emotions, we will continue that process of wanting to, to live in that harmony with truth. Now, you know, Joy, you've done that yourself, right? And you've seen how, bang, your life changes. When you want to take things in harmony with truth, bang, 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 you know, there's a whole series of changes. And I know for yourself there's been this whole series of personal changes that happened in the face of a couple of months that you would never have contemplated would happen in 20 years, right? Yeah. And it's just like floodgates of change just by you taking personal responsibility for your life and wanting to live in harmony with truth and love in your life. And all these changes automatically began happening. And, and if every single person on the planet did that, and or even just every single person in the room did it, you imagine the power that creates around you. It's like all of a sudden every single person around you is triggered in some manner. Every single person around you comes face to face with some emotions and inside of yourself there's a lot of releasing going on of all sorts of things as you personally have experienced, right? And that's the beauty of doing this. It's such a powerful process. And for me, for me um, like, I haven't ever um, wanted anyone else to to take personal responsibility for how I'm feeling. And what, what, what that's meant in the last five or six years is that I can progress and get more and more connected with God and have more and more of those truths flow through me as a result of being connected with God just by allowing this connection of me taking responsibility for everything that's out of harmony. So there's many times in, the pro in my progression in the last five years or six years where I've, where I've, where I've not known what to do or something very damaging to me physically has happened. And I've taken personal responsibility for the how I felt about that every single time and not try to project it onto the universe and blame everybody and get into this state where I'm angry and resentful and you know walk away from God as a result. Instead, I just see everything as God's personal message to me. There's a personal message here to me that's going to help me get closer to God. And as long as I take personal responsibility for what's happening with me, I'm going to get there. And I, I don't need anybody else to help me get there. Because in the end, God's already doing it. And I don't need anybody more than God to do it with me, really. And the problem for many of us is that, is that we think we do. We think we do. Like Many of you still think that you need to be here to do it. Right? And you don't, really. Now, it's lovely having some shortcuts. And that's what... When somebody's, if you recognize somebody's ahead of you in the process, listening to them is a great shortcut to get through a lot of different things that you would have to otherwise get through in maybe a more slow, slower manner. But it's not the whole answer. The whole answer is that at the end I want to be connected with God so I can do everything God's way through myself. And that will automatically draw us all together, ironically, because we'll all be connected with God and at one with God, therefore all in harmony with divine truth, therefore all acting in harmony with God on these certain issues, and we'll all know the truth on these certain issues, and we won't have to go and say, uh, but AJ, what about what would we do in this situation? Or what would I do in that situation? Or how would I act here? Or how would I act there? Because our own connection with God would already be telling us how to do all of those things and act in that, those ways and so forth. If you want to... Um, I find myself being more God-reliant, but I very notice myself going back to being self-reliant and trying to figure things out in my head. How do you stay God-reliant 24-7? Well, every time you get back into your head, it's because you're not allowing yourself to feel what's in your emotions, generally. 
isn't it? Like, like we get into our head because we don't, we can't work out what's going on emotionally, right? So what I try to do in that moment is rather than trying to get into my head and try to work it all out, I try to settle back into my heart again and feel what it's all about, and also feel my feelings towards God of wanting. Do I really want to know the answer of what this is about? And most of the time I find out, no, I didn't want the answer. You know, most of the time I wanted to completely reject the answer and push it away from me and not know it. And then I start looking at the reasons why. And I, and I ask God to actually show me through my law of attraction and through these events that are happening in my life, why it is that I want to reject it. And in almost every case I come up with a fear of some kind that I have to first process through, which I've termed to you a block, a blocking emotion. And, and then I've worked my way through that blocking emotion emotionally, and then as soon as I do that, the underlying emotion comes through and, I get, and, and it's released. But in all that process, I find if I ask somebody else, often I get a whole convoluted thing of happening where lots of people give me different advice and different things, and most of them don't resonate with me, and each one of them has a tendency to get me out of the process of working away through the block itself and then working my way through the emotion. So, so my feelings are, you know the principles involved with the layers of emotions and uh, like you've been taught them in the sense that, uh, in terms of intellectually, now give them a try emotionally, like put them into practice emotionally. See how it goes in your day-to-day -day life. See how you go practicing it. Put it into practice, see what happens. And what you'll find will happen is, uh, is that you will come to the emotional truth of what you intellectually know, and not only that, you will quickly resolve problems that you're facing in your day-to-day -day life. And so, so it's not a process of having to trust somebody else now to tell me what's going on. Right? I don't have to go to somebody and say, can you tell me what's going on? I can't work it out again. And, because I'm always going to God and saying, Actually, I know, God, you're trying to already tell me what's going on. Like, you love me all the time, and you're already trying to tell me what's going on, and the problem I have is that I don't, I'm not listening. <laughs> so can you show me the area in which I'm not listening? What's going on here? And then over the next week, you'll find all sorts of events occur showing you exactly what the problem is, and if you're taking personal responsibility for every one of those events, it will soon be explained to, exposed to you what's really going on inside of yourself. And that's the power of the divine love path in the end. The power of the path is that it makes you totally reliant on God and totally in a place of self-responsibility and it takes away the middleman. The middleman being the teacher, the guru, the avatar, the, 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 the Indian fellow you visit three, four times a year or whatever it is that you, that you do. It takes away that because that you don't need that person. Right? All you need is this connection with God to learn truth. And so um, that's the only way I've learned truth my entire life and every single person on the planet and in the spirit world can practice exactly the same thing. Right? And it just depends totally on how passionate your desire is to find out the truth about a matter as to how rapidly that truth will come to you. And that's the beauty of it. So I would just like to encourage everyone to take personal responsibility in their life. And in particular, for your relationship with God. Desire the truth passionately and take responsibility for that. Like that, your desire for truth. Want God in your face 24-7 telling you truth. You know, want that. And, and when you've got an opportunity to get that from somebody else, Get that as get that as well. Like, I desire this truth in your face, being confronted with it all the time. Because if that if you stay in this space, what will happen is you'll progress as rapidly as you can, working your way through different issues. Of course, you can see that you're going to have to be very, very humble to do that. Can you see that? Like, you're going to have to be so humble that you're willing to listen to a little child reflecting an emotion at you to see what you're actually getting stuck on. You have to be so humble that if you've got a little baby like one years of age, you're going to have to feel what it's crying about 
and know what's going on inside of yourself that's creating it. You have to be so humble that when your little three-year-old comes up and yells and screams at you, you don't give it a tap on the backside anymore. You actually feel your own emotional response to what's going on. And when your teenager comes up and tells you they hate your guts and you're a terrible mother, you actually go through all of the emotion of that. You have to be so humble that you allow yourself to go through all of that. And when your husband comes along and tells you that he's sick and tired of coming home to a dirty house, you have to actually own your emotion there and go through and own and take personal responsibility for this creation that you've got there as well. And when your work, you get fired from work, instead of ranting and raving at them, you need to look at your own emotion and law of attraction regarding abundance and money and all these other factors that are still unhealed within yourself. And when somebody comes along and steals $50,000 from you in a bank rort or some kind of credit union scam or whatever, you're going to have to, instead of yelling and screaming at them and blaming them and trying to take them to court, own your own emotions about that and what happened inside of you and how, that, how you created that. And then when you break your leg through the car accident, you're going to have to do the same. And then when you also go, uh, 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 driving along in a, uh, in, in a bus that somebody else owns and all of a sudden he swerves and crosses the road and hits another vehicle and all of a sudden you get thrown into the seat in front and break your back, you're going to have to own that as well. right? And then on top of that, if that's not enough, right? you're going to have to own every single thing that blocks you from receiving God's love. Because God is just there right next to you waiting to give you love and the only thing stopping it from happening is your own self, your own will in some way. And you'll have to own all of that as well. And when you're prepared to own everything that much, you'll find your life also becomes ironically a joy to live. Because now everything that happens in your life is your creation. Now that means every really good thing that happens in your life you feel really proud about because that's also something that was created because of what you did bringing yourself into harmony with God's laws and love. So while God's love entering you transforms you, you have got to be a participant in the process. You've got to take personal responsibility for whether you have a pure longing for that love or not. And if you don't take personal responsibility for it, what will happen is God's love will not flow into you until you do. And it's as simple as that in our own progression. So hopefully that's given you some ideas. And the reason why I uh, talked about this subject is very shortly Mary will be starting a course of workshops and many of you have enrolled in some of those workshops. And one of the things that you'll find that Mary talks about, well Mary's, Mary will be talking about a lot of different things, but the three primary things that we've discussed in all of our discussions with you, Mary will be demonstrating to you as far as she can in practice a whole set of principles to help you access those three things, which are humility, a longing for truth, and a longing for love. And of course, if you don't take personal responsibility when you go along to one of these workshops, you can go through all the things that Mary takes you through and the group of helpers that are with her take you through and, and come out the other end none the wiser. Right? Or you can take personal responsibility for what you're about to receive and look at what's going on and really look at this as an opportunity to spend, what is it, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 hours or whatever it is, 15 hours? Yeah, 15 hours of time with, with six or seven people in your face trying to give you truth. Which is really what they're trying to do is help you come to the state of seeing that God is actually in your face 24 by 7 trying to give you truth. Right? And, and you can feel all of your resistance to it and you can feel all the times you don't want to take personal responsibility and you want to weasel out of it, you know, and you want to get out of it and give it to somebody else, all this personal... Res you want to make someone else responsible. Or, you know, nothing's happening for me. Nothing's happening for me in the course. Well, if nothing's happening for you, where's the personal responsibility there? If nothing's happening for you, what have you created there? Can you see? Allow yourself to actually go through those things emotionally. So I thought if I could talk to you about personal responsibility, that may assist you in this process of opening up more and more to God and seeing this as your personal relationship with God, not 
AJ's cult that he's trying to create, as what other people might think. This is your personal relationship with God, and all I'm trying to do is help you have it by telling you some truths about it, that's all. And my personal responsibility is only for my relationship with God, and I am not responsible for anyone else's relationship with God. But I do have a passion to show you how to have one with God if you want to know. That's why I'm here. So thanks for your time again tonight.